we've, we're, we're going through slowly uh, some of the old classical ciphers, encryption ciphers, and the idea is to demonstrate some of the concepts which are used in other ciphers, in real ciphers. Even though these are very simple, we'll see some of the concepts of, or the concepts of substitution and transposition are used in ciphers used today. We mentioned the monoalphabetic cipher. How many keys, the number of keys possible is determined by if we have 26 letters to choose from, then how can we choose a particular mapping from the plain text to ciphertext? And there are 26 factorial possible combinations of mappings from those 26 letters to any combination of uh, or rearrangement of those letters. Such that we only use one letter, uh, a letter once in the output. How long is the key in a particular cipher? In this monoalphabetic cipher? How long is the key? Which is, you know, uh, if I have the plain text. How long is the key in this case? Uh, no, if my plain text was Steve, uh, it doesn't mean the key is five letters. 26 letters. The, the key in this case is this specific mapping. Now, all right, I haven't shown all 26 letters here, but there are 26 letters. This one mapping from A to D, B to Z, and so on, is encrypting or is one key. So each mapping uses a single key. If I had A to Z and B to D and everything else the same, that would be a different mapping. And that would be a different key. So in this case, the key is really just the list of letters. From the 26 letters. We went through monoalphabetic cipher. It just uses... Uh, Oh, we went through breaking it, easy to break using frequency analysis. We went through the Playfair cipher, um, when you learned how to use that. It turns out that that's also easy to break, or relatively easy to break, using analysis based on the frequency of digrams and trigrams and expected words. Polyalphabetic ciphers allow us to use the same letter multiple times in the output. In our monoalphabetic cipher, we only use one of the 26 letters, or we only use a letter of the 26 once in the output. Here we can have multiple occurrences. And the cipher we introduced, the Visionaire cipher, is very simple. It's just the set of 26 general Caesar ciphers. The Caesar cipher we shift by k positions, where k can be 0 to 25. So it gives us 26 different Caesar ciphers. The Visionaire cipher uses one of those 26 for each letter of our plain text. Which one does it use depends upon the keyword. So if our input plain text is i, and normally when we map letters to numbers, we go from zero, start from zero. So the letter A is zero, B is one, and so on. It needs to be defined, but normally in the examples, that's what we'll do. The letter I is the plain text. We encrypt using a general Caesar cipher where the shift is by S positions, and S is the letter, can anyone remember? I think it's 18. S is the uh, letter 18. So we shift by 18 positions to the right, the letter I, and we get the letter A as the output. And then we do the same, we encrypt with a Caesar cipher, the plain text N, but we shift by a different number of positions, dependent upon the next letter in the keyword, I in this case. Our keyword was Tirantorn. And we keep changing the Caesar cipher, one, choosing one of those 26 based upon the keyword in this case. 
the result is that frequency analysis is much harder because the letters in the plain text, let's say the most common letter E in this small piece of plain text occurs four times, E, 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 E. In the cipher text, it maps to different letters in most cases. E maps to M, E maps to L, E to R, E to V, because we have a different alphabet possible in, each, in the encryption of each letter. And therefore, it's much harder to do the analysis to look at, okay, what is the frequency of the letter M in the ciphertext? There will not be a direct mapping back, back to the frequency of a particular letter in the plaintext. So it's much harder to count the frequency of letters here and then work out, well, M corresponds to an E. Because in this instance, M corresponds to E, but in this well, we don't have another M. In this instance, L corresponds to E. So that makes it much harder to break. Almost impossible to break. It's not impossible because of the key word. When we have a long plain text, and I have a, a, you know, a large file I want to encrypt, a large message, I choose a keyword. A short one, because it needs to be something I can remember and that I can tell someone. And when the plain text is longer than the keyword, we simply repeat the keyword, like we've done here. We've repeated it two times to make up the same number of letters as our input plain text. If our plain text was longer, we'd repeat the keyword over and over. That causes the problem or the weakness in this scheme. Because if we have a very long plain text, and we repeat the keyword many times, then it's likely that we'll start to get repetitions in the combination of an input plain text letter and a keyword letter. That is, E with key letter I becomes M. Somewhere later, E with key letter I becomes M. Whenever we have input plain text E, and the letter from the keyword I will always get cipher text M. If we have a lot of plain text letters, then this, that chance goes up. And although it's not easy and it's nothing I can demonstrate in class, it's. Yeah? Uh, what if when we repeat a keyword, we use only half of the keyword? Uh, well, then your keyword is shorter, but you still need to repeat it. You mean. What do you mean, use only half? Uh, if we had another letter here, T, then we'd add an S here. We just keep repeating the letters of the keyword up until we fill out the plain text. Okay? So we don't think of the keyword as a sequence of letters. Don't worry about it. it's the word, it's just a sequence of letters, and we repeat those letters so long as we have a, a key that is as long as the plain text. The problem is that if we have a long plain text and a short key, then we get repetitions and again people can or there are algorithms to start to do analysis of the frequencies of letters in the ciphertext. And the important part is to determine what is the keyword length, and then once you know the length of the keyword, you can start to do frequency analysis of the ciphertext and work out the plain text. So this cipher is breakable because the keyword is shorter than the plain text, and the keyword normally has some structure. It's a word here. There's some structure uh, in, in that word. That is, only certain letters follow other letters. It's breakable. It's much harder than the monoalphabetic ciphers. The weakness is in the repeating and structured keyword. So, to overcome that weakness, make the keyword long, as long as the plain text, and make it random. Don't make it a word, or a combination of words, make it just a random combination of characters. 
and that's what the one, or that's one implementation of the one-time pad. Similar, but use a random key as long as the plain text. And this concept being used in the one-time pad is the only known unbreakable or a cipher with unconditional security. If you use this cipher, then there's no way, if you use it correctly, there's no way for the attacker to find out what the original plain text was. And that's our ideal security, and that's what we'd like with all ciphers. It's very easy to try. You can, it's the same algorithm as here, except choose a keyword which is as long as the plain text and random, random letters instead of a word. Encrypt the same. As a result, there's no repetition and therefore no structure in the ciphertext because everything's random on the input keyword and we just get in the ciphertext, even if there are 12% E's in the plain text, what we'll get in the ciphertext is an equal, on average, an equal number of the letter A and equal as the letter V and K and so on. That is, no letter in the ciphertext will be more frequent than any other letter. The ciphertext will be random. And if the ciphertext is random, then that's achieved our goal of hiding the plain text. The result is that the ciphertext has no statistical relationship with the plain text. Even though the plain text has certain letters more frequent than others, the ciphertext does not. And what happens is that if an attacker has two potential plain text messages, even with a brute force attack, they take some ciphertext, try different keys, if they have two different plain text messages, they'll make up, or they can make up uh, messages that make sense, and there's no way for the attacker to identify which one is correct. An example here, an attacker knows this ciphertext. I've just, it was chosen from the textbook. Here's the ciphertext. The attacker does a brute force attack. Try all possible keys. In theory, they do it. In practice, they cannot, because there's too many keys. But in theory, if they could try all possible keys, then, for example, they would attempt one key. This key with this ciphertext, and they get this plain text. It makes sense. It's a combination of English words. It's a phrase, in fact. With the same ciphertext, if they try some other key, in the key two here, which is this one, it gets this plain text. So the attacker has done a brute force attack. They'll get more than just those two that make sense, but they get these two messages, potential plain text that make sense. Which one is the correct plain text? Which one was the original plain text? Do you know? There's no way to know. Right, they can guess, but that's, that, that's of no use to them, especially when you have multiple. So. Even if we apply a brute force attack on a one-time pad, try all possible keys, many keys will give us potential plain text that makes sense. And therefore, the attacker has no way to know which one is the correct plain text. We saw when we did the brute force attack on the Caesar cipher, we decrypted some plain text with 26 keys, only one of them made sense. In that way, the attacker found the plain text. Here we have many that make sense, that are they're English phrases. The attacker has no way to choose the correct one. And that's why this is unbreakable. Yes, the, the mapping... Yeah, the, ma the algorithm that's used in this example is the same as we used in Vision Air Cipher. Just use the Caesar Cipher multiple times and the shift depends upon the, the key letter. Exactly the same. But in fact, you can implement the one-time pad differently. 
It doesn't have to be this algorithm. The concept, it can be implemented with binary values and using exclusive OR, for example. It's very simple to implement. But in this example, yes, it's the same. Uh, no, the, remember the normal user chooses, has the plain text. Let's say I had this plain text. I choose a random key. I just use, choose a random combination of letters. It's this combination. I apply the one-time pad, that is take the plain text M, shift by P positions, where P is whatever number it is, 15 or whatever, and that gives us A. R, shift by X positions, gives us N and so on. So that's easy. Uh, the space is just introduced here to make it easier to read. Let's say space is the 27th character. Uh, encryption or decryption? Okay, so coming back, space is just introduced to make it a bit easier to read. That Our alphabet has 27 characters. 26 letters plus the space character. We can put other characters in if we want to extend the alphabet. Yes. The only way to get the true plain text is to know the key. And of course, by de well, the assumption is that the key is secret, that only the attacker doesn't know the key. And there's no way to find the key from the algorithm. So the attacker, if you don't know the key, you won't be able to discover the key nor find the plain text. we got? Uh, now let's see if this was the quick example. That's a good point. There's something wrong here. Uh, what have we done? Oh, sorry. If you take this plain text, and encrypt with this key, you will not get this. You'll get something else. Let's say this was the correct plain text. Oh, sorry, what have we got? Here's our cipher text, C. Maybe we do have a mistake. And we have key one. Key two and plain text two. Uh, I think you've got a point here. M encrypt with key letter M should give us the same if we encrypt M and M here. Um, why is that wrong? Yeah. Yes. Yes. There is a problem there. That is M, plain text M encrypted with key M should produce the same as plain text M encrypted with key M here, but it doesn't in our ciphertext. I need to check that ciphertext, see if it's the right one that matches these two keys. I'll check in the textbook again, because that's where this example comes from. And I'll let you know tomorrow what the correct ciphertext is. That doesn't look correct.
the point from our one-time pad is that we will get many, many potential plain texts that make sense if we try all possible keys. And therefore, no way to know which one is the correct key, and therefore the correct plain text. So we have to, I is 9, and S is 19, so it should be B. What is I? I is 9. Is it the ninth or the 10th letter? If we start with 0? Oh. So with most of the examples that I think we've gone through, if we map letters in the alphabet to numbers, I've assumed the letter A is 0. The letter Z is 25. It doesn't have to be. We could map it some other way. But in, I think all of the examples I've used, I've used that. Coming back, there's one more question. An example of what? Encryption. I think I know now. Okay. Okay. Because you use the same logo as yep. Okay, another example of the one-time pad. Here we've used it on English letters. Let's say we have some binary message. That is, we have a message that we want to send in English. We use the ASCII code to convert each character to a binary value, some seven-bit value. And we come up with some plain text. I'm just randomly making up Let's say it means something. And there's many more bits. Here's our plain text, some binary data. We can apply the one-time pad on this, the concept of the one-time pad, using an exclusive OR. I choose a key. And the key needs to be chosen which is the same length as the plain text, same number of bits, and random. So now I use a random number generator and choose random values. And the key needs to be a random sequence of zeros and ones. We haven't spoken too much about random numbers. We'll have an entire lecture on random numbers. But I think you understand that it, the basic principle of a random sequence of characters. On average, how many zeros are there compared to ones? There should be 50% zeros, 50% ones if it's random. And if we look at a subsequence within that subsequence, we should have 50% zeros and 50% ones. We should have no patterns in there and so on. We can encrypt using an exclusive OR. Simply exclusive OR the plain text with the key and get our ciphertext. Zero, exclusive OR zero. One exclusive or one? Okay. One, zero, and so on. By exclusive or our plain text with a random sequence of bits, we get cipher text, which is also seen as a random sequence of bits. This is another implementation of the one time pad. The same concept of applies and very easy to implement in hardware and software. Exclusive OR is a very simple operation. So the concept is the same. Of course, you can implement it differently depending on your input plain text and how, uh, how you need to implement it in software or hardware. 
still, if the attacker has the ciphertext and they try all possible keys, they'll get a set of plain text messages that make sense. What makes sense? Well, in binary, the original plain text had some meaning. Maybe it was, as we said, these map back to English letters using ASCII code. So same if we tried all possible keys, we'll get potential plain text that will map back to English phrases. Some of them will make sense if we apply a brute force attack. So there'll be no way for the attacker to try all keys and discover that, in fact, this is the original plain text, the true original plain text. So the one-time pad is our only known unbreakable cipher. Even with a brute force attack, it's secure. What's wrong with it? Why is it not practical? Good answer. Yes, the key is the problem. How to generate the key and how to distribute the key. Go back. In this example, I had my plain text message. I choose the key, just a, a short word. I write it down on a piece of paper or I send it in the email to the person I want to send to or I tell them. That's easy to distribute the key. It was easy for me to choose the key. I just chose a word that I was familiar with and send it. It's only what, for 10 letters long. Even if my plain text was a 10 gigabyte file, I ch still just choose a 10 letter key. I send the 10 gigabyte file, or the other person has the 10 gigabyte file, which is encrypted. They just need the 10 letter key from me in the Vision Air cipher. That's, that works in practice. In one time pad, the key needs to be as long as the plain text. So, if I want to encrypt a 10 gigabyte file, I need to choose a key which is 10 gigabytes in length. So now I need to send not a 10 character <coughs> key to the other person, I need to send a 10 gigabyte key to the other person so that they can decrypt their ciphertext. That's not practical in many cases. Distributing keys like that is not possible. Also, that 10 gigabyte key that I chose had to be random. It has to be random, and the next time I encrypt a different file, it has to be random also and different from the previous one. And the next time I encrypt something, it needs to be different. So in fact, what we need is to be able to generate a very, 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 very long sequence of values and to do that uh, quickly and to make sure that the output, the key, is in fact random. Turns out that that's hard. It's not an easy problem to do that in practice, to generate long random sequences. It's not easy to distribute the keys when they're long and it's not easy to generate random values very long random values. Let's say over a period of one year I'm an organization and I want to encrypt terabytes of data, then I'll need terabytes of keys. That is terabytes of random numbers which is not easy to generate. So that's why the one-time pad has very limited practical use. Even though it's secure, the keys cause problems in their use. Only very useful if you have a very short message, plain text, and you uh, maybe have some special device for generating the random characters, uh, the random key. Yeah? Yep. Yes. In this one, when we send the key, or the key word is Sirenthorn. The key is a combination of that word. 
up to the same length as the plain text, but we only need to send the keyword because the receiver knows the algorithm. Once they have the keyword, just repeat it until they get the same length of the plain text. So that's easy. So that covers the only examples we're going to go through for the substitution ciphers. There are others, there are many others, but they demonstrate some concepts. Demonstrate the basic substitution, demonstrate we can do frequency analysis to do a more intelligent attack. We've demonstrated brute force attacks and we've arrived at improving ciphers from the Caesar cipher through to the one-time pad until we get something that is perfect in terms of security but bad in terms of how easy it is to use. Let's quickly look at two examples of transposition techniques. <coughs> we said in any cipher there are two basic operations. Substitution, we take some letter and replace with another. And transposition, we rearrange the letters or permutate the letters. Demonstrate transposition with just two examples. First, what's called a, a rail fence transposition. And the algorithm is we take our plain text, we write it in diagonals over n rows. So n, the depth, is, needs to be known, and that's our key in this case. <coughs> what do we mean by over n rows? Here, for example, if our depth, or if we have three rows, here's our plain text, we write it uh, I, N, T, E, R, N, and so on. N, uh, e, T, T. That is, write the plain text row by row over a depth of three rows in this example. In, I, N, T, E, R, N, E, T, T, E, C, H, N, O, L, I hope I've got this right. Simply write the plain text over three rows. And our cipher text, we read row by row. The cipher text <coughs> becomes I, I'll write it in uppercase just to distinguish, E, 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 N, O, E. The first row <coughs> followed by the second row. followed by the third row. So that's the algorithm. <coughs> All it has done is rearrange those letters. We haven't replaced one letter with another. We've just rearranged the input plain text letters to get this and, and continue. <coughs> of course, frequency analysis is easy on this because there are, there's some structure in the plain text and that structure flows through to the cipher text because we haven't replaced any letters. And in this case, if the attacker knows the cipher text, they can use frequency analysis to learn some information and f based upon um, diagrams, trigrams, frequencies of words, 
they need to find the depth. Once they know the depth, they've found easily the plain text because if we know the depth is 3, we write I, <coughs> we write our characters I, E, 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 and then of the total set of characters, divide by 3 and then move to the next row and the next row. Maybe applic you will check that in your own time. <laughs> it's your homework. The answers are on the next slide, I think. Or I have answers somewhere. So that's an example of a transposition. Not secure because of the analysis is very easy, but rearranges those letters. Another one. No. Uh, so think in this case, <coughs> plain text, the key is the depth. If I had a depth of 4, then I would write I N T E R N and I'd read row by row. I'd, if I had a depth of 4, I'd have 4 rows here and read. Then I, to get the ciphertext, I write down the first row, the second row, the third row, the fourth row. You've had a depth of four. Uh, one low followed by second low. Yep. The first low, second low, third low. Okay. Yeah, read the rows in order, row by row. Yep. Take the plain text, write the plain text across a n rows, and then read the first row, the second row, the third row, and so on to get the ciphertext. Yep. Therefore, we have one to four. Okay. Yep. Okay, everyone can decrypt some ciphertext. And in fact, with a, a small depth, it's not hard to break because you can try trial and error different depths. That is, try a depth of one and see what you get, a depth two, a depth three, and so on. A brute force attack is possible. Another example. The ro a rows columns transposition cipher. <coughs> Here our key is a sequence of numbers indicating columns that we're going to encrypt. We have our plain text and our key. Our key is a number here where each number indicates a column. So what we do is we write our key and we write the plain text in rows. Our key has six values so we're going to have six columns we write our plain text row by row. Security. And wrap around to the next row. Simply write our plain text row by row where the number of columns is determined by the key. Security. And cryptography we're missing some value here let's just fill it in with some other character X for example now to get our cipher text we read column by column ordered by the keyword or the, the key number in this case write down the first column. Oh, well the first thing we write down is this column. Column 1 in our output. That is E Y Y A. Read by columns. E, 
rearranged by the number here. EYYA will be written down first, and then this column is second in the ciphertext. R-D-O-Y. So we're not just re reading column, 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 but we're rearranging those columns. We don't take this column, then this one, then this one. We take the column indicated by the key number here. 3 is S-T-R-R. -R. 4. Running out of space. C-A-P-P. -P. And 6, U-N-T-H. That's our ciphertext. Re repeat. We take our plain text, write row by row, where the number of columns is determined by the key. In this case, six columns, because we have a, a, a six uh, digit key. This is the key, this is the ciphertext. Yeah. Read column by column, except that the columns are arranged based upon the key. Yeah. In this case, if, if it's an uneven, then we, we, we can add an X at the end. Yeah. We fill things out where needed. Same here, we added, added an X down here to make sure we have an even number of rows and columns there. We'll fill it out. What do we do to decrypt? Uh, divide by the number of columns. This is one that confuses most people, including me. I always got this wrong in an exam, writing the exam once. Decrypting the rows column. So how can I take the exam? <laughs> I made a mistake and the, the question wasn't marked. It was too hard for the students. Uh, work out how to decrypt this. Uh, de decrypt from the normal users, not the attacker's perspective. Yeah. How many characters first? We have 24 characters here. So the, the receiver receives the ciphertext, receives 24 characters. Key, they know, the receiver, not the attacker. Six numbers, we're going to have six columns. So they know that they need to break the ciphertext into blocks of four. Because we have 24 characters, six columns, we're going to have four rows. What's next? <coughs> then they write this column, they write each block as a column. E Y Y A is going to be a column, R D O Y is another column, and so on. Then you need to make sure those columns are in the right order, and that's based upon the key. In the ciphertext, the first block is going to be our first column, E, Y, Y, A. The first column from our ciphertext, in fact, because one is the second digit in our key, will become the second column in our plain text. <coughs> column two, that is, this needs to be column two, C-O-L, column two. R-D-O-Y, the second column 
here, where 2 is, is in fact 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the fifth column in the plain text. So this will be column 5, out of space again. Column 3 becomes the first column in the plain text. S T R R. The fourth block is the last column, I C G X. Fifth block is the third column. And the last one, the sixth block, is the fourth column. So just practice encryption and decryption using this because, and then you'll work it out of how do you make use of the key to rearrange the ciphertext to get the plain text. And in most cases, uh, yep, sorry. Uh, because we have 24 characters in total, the key is six digits in length. 24 divided by six, that is, we have 24 characters written across six columns, which means there must be four rows. 24 divided by six is four. And that's why we know there's a block of four. Four rows means that Row 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. If we write this as a column, row 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay. Everyone in the quiz tomorrow can decrypt. Yeah, tomorrow we'll have a quiz. Using any of the ciphers we've gone through to date, you should be able to do a simple encryption or decryption. And in some cases, you should be able to break them without the key. Not too long, but in simple cases. Uh, you, if you look in past quizzes, one of them was here's here's some um, cipher text. There's no key. Find the plain text. you can try different columns. We need to first, to break this, we need to know the length of the key. That's one thing we need to work out. Then, if we know that, we'll need to know the, what is the key, what is the arrangement of those columns. And that's where you can use language analysis, that is, that, uh, for example, some letters only follow others to work out what are the most likely arrangement of those columns. It's unlikely, let's look at the first letter. If we worked out the length of the key, if it's six, we have E, R, S, I, C, U. Some arrangement of those letters needs to make a word at the start. It's unlikely to be uh, what? R, S, C. Can anyone think of a word that starts with R, S, C? So it's unlikely to be this one at the start followed by this and this. It's possible that it could be, and it's unlikely to be R, C something. R, C. It's possible to be S, I something. There are some words that start with S, I. S I C, S I U, S I R, S I E, maybe some of those possibilities. So, based upon what words exist in a dictionary, you can, some column arrangements are more likely than others. And you can start to cut down which one's the most likely or possible, and with some trial and error, that is, try some, you'll start to see that, okay. Some arrangement of these letters are going to make a word. And once you know the arrangement, then you know the arrangement of the columns and you know the key. So you'd need to guess somehow that 
well, guess, try that it needs to be the arrangement S, E, C, U, and so on. <coughs> and you don't have to do it just on this letter, you can do it on the second letter because they should also re arrange to make words. The increase tomorrow uh, will it give us some partial credits if it makes some mistakes on either decrypting and encrypting? Uh, not, not always. Sometimes you can, uh, depends how complex it is. You should be able to get most of the encryptions or decryptions correct. They're not that hard. Some that are more complex, then you may be get marks for just steps. Of course, you can always validate your answer, or in most cases, you can validate your answer. If you encrypt something and get ciphertext, you can validate by decrypting that ciphertext, and you should get the original plain text. If you made a simple mistake, then you'll get different plain text, and you'll detect that. Yes, we can use similar concepts that based upon the statistics of the language. That's the concept there. So easy to break a single iteration of this. But transposition ciphers, when we combine them with substitution ciphers, can add security. And in fact, if we combine multiple iterations of a transposition cipher, we can add security. Let's see that in the next slide. Where's my pointer gone? So that was an example of a rearrangement using the rows column cipher. Here's an example where we'll go through and use the rows column cipher or transposition cipher twice. Let's see. We can make transpos transposition ciphers stronger by applying them multiple times. See how it works. We have our plain text, some message, attack, postpone until 2 a.m. We have a key, so the normal user has the key. They apply the rows column cipher. You can do this in your own time. This is the cipher text that you get. Okay? So you encrypt this with the key 4312567 and you get this cipher text. If you encrypt that cipher text again with the same key you get this. That is apply the same cipher a second time where the plain text is this, the key is 4312567, you'll get this output NSC da 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 so on. Now Let's see some patterns in here. What these numbers show are the original plain text letters in order. That is, take this letter A, that's the first letter. Okay? T is the second letter. The second T here is the third letter. And we keep going the 14th. And in fact, we have 28 letters there. Just number the letters in order, 1 through to 28. Then, if you apply the cipher, we get this is the cipher text. What that does is it rearranges the input plain text. And the arrangement is such that the first letter A here moves to the 13th position. A, this A, if we followed it after, through that encryption, moves to here. And that's what these numbers represent. That letter 1 is moved into this position, which is the 13th position. Letter 2, T, letter 2 is moved into, where is it? The ninth position in the ciphertext. That is, this T moves to here. And the letter Z here, 28, ended up in the same position at the end. So what these numbers show is if we instead of look at the letters but look at the positions of those letters in the sequence of the 28 letters, they're of course first in order, 1 to 28. We apply the cipher, we rearrange those letters. 
such that the first one moves to here, the second one to here, the 21st moves to... Where is 21? Here, the 27th, and so on. The y, we'll show that in a moment. It's just the rearrangement of the letters. It's showing the current arrangement of the letters after one encryption, one transposition. Can you see a pattern in these numbers? How do we know? Because I give this the number one, okay? And I encrypt and I follow it as I sit, go through the encryption. All right? Here, S is number one. Uh, no, sorry, let's make this clear. This is, not, uh, this is not the steps of the algorithm. It's not the output of the algorithm. This, these numbers are showing the s sequence of letters. Think of this example. Letter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, letter 24. So S is in position 1 at the start. U E is in position 2, or letter 2. X is position 24 at the start. We encrypt, and S, after encryption, moved to position 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. S moved to position 9. That is... Let's do the first few characters here. S, which is 1. After we encrypted that, it moved to position 9. E moved to the, first, the start. E is the second letter. C, the third letter, moved to here. Somewhere around here. Uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This Y, letter eight in the original plain text, moved to the second letter in the cipher text. The first letter in the cipher text was letter two from our plain text. The second letter from the cipher text was letter 8 from the plain text. That's all we're showing here. The th first letter of the cipher text is the third letter from the plain text. The first letter of the cipher text is the third letter from the plain text. The second letter of the cipher text is letter 10. This T is this T. It's moved from 10th position to the second position and so on for the rest. It's showing the arrangement of those letters or the rearrangement. So it's just, show. just showing. But just to like, like this one, yes, one, this is how we encrypt. So this is the arrangement after one encryption. What is the pattern in these numbers? It's not random. Look for the pattern. It's very reasonably obvious. They're separated by 7. 3, 10, 17, 24. 31? No. 4, 11, 18, 25. In groups of four, why groups of four? Because we have a keyword which is seven, 28 characters. We have 28 divided by seven. In groups of four, each number is shifted by, se or shifted by seven positions. So four, 11, 18, 25, 2, 9, 16, and so on. So there's some pattern here. 
whenever there's some pattern recognizable in the ciphertext, it normally means that it's easier for the attacker to break that because they can make use of that pattern to find the original plain text. So it's a reasonably obvious pattern here after one encryption. If we take this ciphertext as input to the rows column cipher and apply it again, then this is the arrangement of letters. That is, letter 1, this A, ends up at position here, position 22, which is here. Plain text, encrypt once, encrypt two times, this A moves to here. Letter 1 moves to this position. Letter 2, this T, moves to, where is it, here, the ninth position. T moves to here. So this shows the arrangement of the original plain text letters after the second transposition. Look for the pattern. pattern. The first, after the first encryption, the pattern was that we shifted by seven. Can anyone see a pattern here? Not so obvious. I cannot see any pattern. Here I can, after a little bit of effort, you can see a pattern. It didn't take someone long to find that. Here, well, this goes down by 8, minus 4, plus 22. There's no simple pattern like that, not, not a sequence of numbers. It's much harder to immediately recognize any pattern here, any structure. To me, this looks random, a random sequence of numbers. This does not look random. 3, 10, 17, 24 does not look random to me. This after applying the same transposition twice, we've added security to the output by making or by hiding the structure of the input. The input had some structure, 1 through to 28. After first encryption, there's some sort of structure. After the third, not so obvious if there's any structure. Again and again and again, and it looks like simply a random sequence of numbers and that's secure. So by applying a transposition multiple times we add security. And similar with the other ciphers, not just this rows column. Multiple operations can increase the security there. So that's the main point there. Try and follow what happened, but make sure you don't miss the main point. Applying a transposition cipher in stages, not just once, but multiple times, can increase the security of the output. Any questions on this one? That is important when we look at real ciphers. Of course, yeah. So the exam question. Is it only one time? What What was the exam question? If you look in last year's exam, there was a a question which gave you some cipher text. It didn't give you a key. It asks you to find the key and the plain text. So that was to break that. You can attempt that in some cases. Uh, so, yeah, only one time in the, in the exam last year. Yeah. If it was applied multiple times, I would let you know. Yeah. Going from this and manually in an exam trying to get this would take you forever or would take you a long time, too long for the exam. Going from this and getting this manually, well, difficult, maybe time consuming, but possible within, I don't know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Probably too long for an exam. 
Let's move on before we get on to the real ciphers of DES. We'll come back to this concept of applying transpos transposition multiple times uh, in the next topic. Rotor machines, just one other example of, in fact, applying ciphers in multiple operations. They were what was used in the Enigma cipher in World War II. Uh, you can have a look at that in your own time, but at that point in time, which is what, 60 years ago, they were considered strong but eventually broken by uh, analysts. Uh, they used basically ciphers, monoalphabetic ciphers, uh, and they applied it multiple times. Using one monoalphabetic cipher is not very strong, but encrypting some plain text, taking the output, and then encrypting that again, and again, added strength to the output ciphertext. You can read on websites or in the textbook of how that worked. That's just one example to look in your own time, the rotor cipher. This is an example of, okay, a monoalphabetic cipher. A, move to this position. B, to move to this position in the monoalphabetic cipher. They're the letter. In this case, it's from 1 to 26. Yeah. But we'll not ask you a question on that in the exam. <coughs> Sorry? No, the, the rotor machine is just an application of the, uh, the monoalphabetic cipher, but multiple times. We'll come back to this concept of applying a cipher multiple times to add security in the next topic. Last subtopic here, steganography. This is not encryption. What we've gone through is how to take some plain text, encrypt and get some cipher text. This is something slightly different. Steganography is about hiding a message inside another message. I want to send a message to someone. I hide that message inside a usually larger message, send the larger message, and the idea is that the person who knows the algorithm I've used can find the hidden message, but an attacker cannot find the hidden message. So we're not rearranging letters, we're just hiding a message in another message. It works by well, it assumes that the person receiving knows the algorithm I used. Many examples in the past. Uh, let's say you have a long document. You have some algorithm that selects particular letters from that, and those letters combined make up some message. Invisible ink, or some marking on particular letters. Someone writes a letter, just a normal letter, looks normal, and there's very small pinholes put above some letters. So when you hold it up to the light, you can see which letters are marked. Those letters make up the hidden message. The original written letter was the fake message. The idea is that an attacker or some other entity does not know that the two users are communicating a hidden message. With encryption, if I encrypt a message and send it to someone, the attacker, someone else, can intercept that message. They won't know the original message, but they'll know that we're communicating with encryption. That may be useful sometimes. If I'm a, a journalist in some country and I'm trying to send messages out and they contain information that someone wants to censor, then if I use encryption, then that organization that wants to censor me may block the communications because they see it's encrypted. Must mean you're doing something bad. We will not let that through. But if I use steganography, I take my real message and hide it inside some nice picture of the seaside and send that picture out. 
maybe the person trying to censor sees, okay, this is just a nice picture of the seaside, I'll let that through. But in fact, that picture had a, another message hidden inside it. So one benefit of steganography, it can hide the fact that two people are communicating securely or communicating certain information, attempting to be secure. It does not look like you are hiding anything. That's the point. Encryption, people know you're hiding something or you're encrypting something. Here they don't necessarily know that you're sending some, something that's trying to be hidden. The problem with steganography is that once an attacker knows what method you're using, they'll immediately discover the message. If the attacker knows that you're using pin holes above certain letters, they just hold up your message to the light and they'll see your hidden message. And in practice, normally we need to take a real message and hide it inside a larger fake message. That is inefficient in terms of communications. To send a small message, I need to send a large fake message. I'll give you two examples. Here's one example. What's, those students who have taken this before don't answer, but the students new to this course, what's the message here? What's the hidden message? Did you say? Okay, someone's very close. The exact message? Your package ready Friday 21st, room 3, please destroy this immediately. So, by taking the last, or George even, by taking the last word of each line and read that. The last letter of each line, your package ready Friday 21st, room 3, please destroy this immediately. Chaos, Chaos yours. <laughs> so here's an example of a hidden message inside a fake message. If you didn't know that algorithm, that is the last letter of each line, you would think, okay, this is just some professor sending a message to his colleague. But in fact, it's also got a hidden message in there. Once you know the algorithm, everyone goes, oh, that was easy. Once you know the algorithm, it's very easy to find the message. And that's the problem. And it's inefficient because I need to send, what, 100 letters to send a real message which has 10 letters, uh, 10 words, 100 words. It can be cooler than that. In practice, let's have a, another one which is a little bit more realistic. Uh, Here's a, an image, it's a JPEG, it's just a flag. So a JPEG has some structure in it, that is some, uh, each pixel is represent, represented some, by some binary value inside the file. So let's say in simple form every pixel is an 8-bit value and each pixel that 8-bit value represents a color. So the value 0, 0, 0, 8 zeros, is the color, is it black or white? I, let's say it's the color white. The 8-bit uh, value all ones is the color black. And the numbers in between 0 and one, all ones are other colors in the spectrum. Okay? 
So there's some number that represents this red pixel here. There's another number that represents a blue pixel. That's an, a normal image. We'll use that as our fake message. Uh, the idea is that if let's say red is an 8-bit value or this red pixel here, one of those dots, is this 8-bit value. Okay, I don't know what the real value is but it's an 8-bit uh, color image. Then with 8 bits we have 256 different values. This color where, sorry, where just the last bit is modified is just a different shade of red. It's a slightly, very close to the same red there, but slightly different. The idea is to take the JPEG image in selected or all of the pixels, modify, say, one of the bits such that from the human eye, what's displayed does not change much. That is, if I display a pixel of this color and then next to it a pixel of this color, you will not be able to tell the difference. They both look like this red. But we'll use this last pixel, this bit here, uh, the last bit in the pixel, to represent our message. Because we'll do that not just in one pixel but in all the pixels. So one of the bits of the eight are part of our message. Of the next pixel another bit is part of the message and we'll use bits from all of those pixels to represent our real message that we want to hide in here. That's the concept. <coughs> Let's No, this is not encryption. This is we use an algorithm to hide one message inside another. Once the algorithm is known, then it's no longer secure. There is software that will do it for you. Uh, I have a message. This is the message I want to hide inside the image. The idea is I'm going to take that image, send it in an email to someone. If someone intercepts, they think I'm just sending a, a, a picture of a flag to them. But I'm going to hide this message inside that image. And it's not very exciting because you just use some software to do that for you. Outguess is one piece <coughs> of software. It takes the data from that file, my message, takes our input image file and we produce an output image file, JPEG. This software applies an algorithm that takes the message, the text message, takes the input image, modifies some of the bits in that input image to contain the message and produces an output image. It changed 118 bits in that case. All right, we don't need to understand all this. We had a, I think it was a 3,000 byte image. It changed some of those bits. Those bits contain the message. If we look at the output image, that's the output image. If we look at the input image, that's the input. Where is it? This is the output image. Look at it. That, this is the input image. 
The input, output. No, notice, no noticeable difference. They look the same. So by just changing some parts of the image, we can contain the message in there. How do you know the message is in there? Uh, you can look at the difference, but the program tells us, I hope. How? I can't remember. Sorry. I've got to get this correct and then we'll demonstrate. All right, let's show again. What we're doing is simply taking the received message, the output JPEG that we generated, and taking the message in that and putting it in an output text file. And if it worked, all right, you have to believe me, but that's the original message. So we encode, in this case, we use some of the bits in the input to encode the real message. The, there are different algorithms for selecting which bits to replace. This, this software used one particular algorithm. The same, yeah. 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 We need to use the same algorithm. This takes advantage of the fact that in an image, because it's, you, it's inspected by the human eye, small differences in colors we will not detect. And in fact, in some file formats, that some information in there, even if we modify it, we will not be able to detect that modification visually. Yeah? This is up to the, how many bits each color it's a, about, yes, that's right. Uh, also, the structure of the JPEG. Yep. If the color had, say, 24 bit per pixel, then we need to use, a, uh, we can do a similar approach. Yeah. Yes, that's right. If if it was a four bit color image then and we change one of those bits then possibly we'd be able to detect with our eyes we can do the same with a video a video is just many images a sequence of images to create motion so we can do the same in a video encode another message inside a video someone sees a video but they decode that and get the original hidden message and there are other ways to do it not encryption, it's about hiding information in other messages, steganography. And that finishes our classical encryption ciphers. Let's move to the next topic so we can get started for tomorrow. The main point is to understand what is steganography and the advantages and disadvantages.
So that was about classical ciphers, ciphers starting 2,000 years ago, things that are quite old, no longer secure. Now let's try to move on to seeing how the principles work in real ciphers. And the real cipher we'll spend a bit of time on, time on is DES, the Data Encryption Standard. It's a cipher that's been used over the last 20 or 30 years. It has some limitations today, that is some better ciphers today, but the concepts demonstrate what's used in many other ciphers. But first, let's look at the general concept of encryption with block ciphers, the principles. We've mentioned briefly in, I think, the first topic that we can have block ciphers and stream ciphers. The difference is the amount of plain text they operate on, and the practical difference really is the implementation and the speed at which uh, the implementations work. A block cipher takes a block of data, encrypts, gets ciphertext output. A stream cipher does the same, except that block is usually just a bit or a byte. So we're operating on smaller blocks of data, essentially. The approach of a stream cipher is that we take some key, have some algorithm to generate normally some what's called cryptographic stream. Simply think of it as a random sequence of bits. Take our plain text and exclusive or with this random sequence our plain text and get our cipher text. That's a typical implementation of a stream cipher. This is the main part, the algorithm used here. XOR exclusive or, this is, is very simple. I have a bit of plain text, I have a bit of my cryptographic stream, just exclusive or them, and I get my ciphertext. This is useful when we want to encrypt things in real time. I generate the data, immediately I generate some bits as an output of my algorithm, and I simply exclusive or them. Exclusive OR can be implemented quickly in most hardware and software. Fast to do encryption. A block cipher, so in our stream cipher, normally we exclusive OR one bit or possibly one byte at a time. Take a byte of our plain text, XOR, get ciphertext. Take the next byte and so on. Block cipher encrypts a block of plain text, usually 64 bits, 8 bytes, or 128 bits, so you can have longer. It in takes a plain text block as input, B bits, so 64 bits, takes a key, applies our encryption algorithm, and gets our B bits as output. So slightly different approach to a stream cipher where we generate what's called a cryptographic stream or simply a random sequence of bits, XOR with the plain text. So this is the important part here. Block cipher, take the plain text, encrypt, and we're not necessarily using an XOR operation to generate a stream of bits. In practice, block ciphers are used to encrypt data, stream ciphers to encrypt information in real time. By data, sorry, I mean, for example, files. Uh, things that we store. Stream cipher encrypt information that's generated in real time and, and usually communicated immediately. Software or hardware? Yes, you can implement hardware to do the encryption and to do XORs and so on. Yeah. Of course, it'll be faster normally in hardware. So you can have dedicated hardware that will do some of the operations we'll go through. We're going to focus on block ciphers now. That's all. Have B bits of plain text. Have a key. Apply some encryption algorithm and get B bits of ciphertext output. And that's the same approach we used with our classical ciphers. Take some input plain text, get the same size output ciphertext. 
what if I have a one megabyte file to encrypt and B is 128 bits? Then I just process the file in order. Take the first 128 bits, encrypt. Take the next 128 bits, encrypt. And the output would be many different ciphertexts. And I could combine them and get the, the long or the, the full ciphertext. For a block cipher to work, we need what's called a reversible mapping from the plaintext to the ciphertext. So some concepts or some terminology. An n-bit block cipher where the input b bits, if we have n bits here, we take an n-bit plaintext and produce an n-bit ciphertext. N can be some value. There are two to the power of n possible different plaintext blocks. I have a simple case. If I say we have a two bit block cipher, I take two bits of plain text. I take a key, I encrypt with some algorithm, I get two bits of ciphertext. Now that's a two bit block cipher, as an example. The possible inputs to this cipher are these four values. That is, with a two-bit block cipher, I have four possible inputs. I can only take two bits in, so I have four possible values. Therefore, with an n-bit block cipher, I have two to the power of n possible input plaintext blocks. <coughs> two to the power of n possible inputs, two to the power of n possible outputs. <coughs> the encryption, that is, this algorithm takes some input and produces ciphertext which is from the same set. For example, if I encrypt 00 and get 11, if I encrypt with a particular key these plain text values and get these corresponding ciphertext values. That's an example of the encryption algorithm. Encrypt 00, output 11. 01, output 00. And so on. Two bits in, two bits out. N bits in, N bits out, two to the power of N possible inputs. For encryption to work, to make any sense, the encryption process must be reversible. That is, if I encrypt some data, when I decrypt, I get the original data back. That's reversible. This is an example of a reversible mapping. If I encrypt 00 and get 11, 01 and get 10, 10 goes to 00, 11 to 01. One example of a reversible mapping or a reversible transformation. Why is it reversible? Because if I take the ciphertext 1-1 and decrypt, I will get 0-0. 1-0 zero, zero. will become 0-1. 0-0, 1-0, 0-1, 1-1. Zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one, one, one. This is an example of an irreversible irre mapping. These two map to the same ciphertext value. The problem with this, when I decrypt, I have this as the ciphertext. What's the original plaintext? Is it 10 or 11? This is not allowed. We must have a mapping which is reversible. If we restrict to just reversible mappings, if there are two to the n possible inputs, 
there are two to the n factorial possible mappings or transformations. Let's illustrate that. Still our two bit cipher. There are four possible inputs. And they are, of course, zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one, with our two bit block cipher. The transformations, this is one transformation which is allowed. Zero, zero maps to one, one, zero, one to one, zero, and so on. So if that's our plain text, one possible mapping is to take this and, for example, this is one valid mapping. Not very useful, but it's valid because it's reversible. Plain text, output ciphertext. Plain text, ciphertext. If I have the ciphertext, I will find a unique plain text. That's one possible mapping. Another one may be this. Zero, zero becomes zero, one. Zero, one becomes zero, zero, and these are the same. The second possible mapping, it's reversible, and others. Of course, I will not list them all. Sorry, I'll do it in some order. They are possible mappings. So it's just different rearrangements of these four values. And we can keep going, and you can, at home tonight, write them all down. How many are there? Four factorial, 24 different values, or different mappings. Two to the power of two factorial. That is, if we have four different elements, there are four factorial possible arrangements of those. So, if we have an m-bit block cipher and we allow only reversible mappings, we have a 2 to the n factorial possible reversible mappings. Uh, okay, let's see how that is of use to us. So first, understand why we cannot have an irreversible mapping. Because if we have the ciphertext, 0, 1, we don't know what the original plaintext is. Was it 1, 0 or 1, 1? We must have a reversible mappings. As a result, 2 to the n factorial valid reversible mappings. An ideal block cipher would map one value to one of the possible other values, one of those valid reversible mappings. One way we can illustrate that is shown here. Here's a four-bit block cipher. Four bits input. We can say that there are 16 possible states on the input. With four bits, there are 16 values from 0, 0, 0, 0 up to 1, 1, 1, 1. Two to the power of four different values. There are, here we have four possible inputs. With four bits, we'd have 16 possible inputs. So we take our input plain text and our cipher maps to, or maps to a particular cipher text output does the transformation. So of our four bits input, we get 
one of 16, or we get 16 possible states. We transform that, that is equivalent to here. We choose one of these rearrangements. If this is the input, this is the out, if this is the output ciphertext, then that's a particular transformation. And eventually we get four bits output, the ciphertext. This is just one example of a transformation. Of course, there are many other combinations of transformations here. How many? This is one transformation. How many are there in total? How many transformations are possible with a 4-bit block cipher? 16 factorial. So this arrangement, which is just randomly chosen for the example, is a transformation. There are 2 to the power of 4 factorial possible transformations, which is 16 factorial. Here, with a 2-bit block cipher, we have 4 factorial possible transformations, 24. Each, in this case, how many possible keys do we have? No. With the 2-bit block cipher, if we use this ideal mapping, then we have 24 possible keys. That is, we have input plain text. 24 possible output ciphertexts because there's 24 rearrangements of these four values. Each mapping from plain text to one of these ciphertexts is performed by using a single key. If I use one key, I will get this output. If I use key two, I will get this output. If I use key three, this output. If I use key 24, I would get the other the last output. So with 24 possible transformations, there are 24 possible keys in that case, or the same number of keys as transformations. Oh, OK, we'll ignore the, that, but we still could use it, yeah. The first one probably doesn't make much sense, but let's count it as one of the valid ones. How big is the key in that 2-bit block cipher? How big is the key? How big? How big? How many bits? Bits. Uh, eight. Why eight? Eight is correct. Yes. In fact, we can think of these four values as the key. That is, if I have plain text, and we know it's in order, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, one possible transformation maps 0, 0 to 0, 0, and so on, and we use these four bits to indicate that transformation. That is, we just record for key 1 these four values. For key 2, these four values. And for key 3, these four values. So we have 2 to the power of 2 factorial keys. We had 2 to the power of 2 factorial transformations or mappings and each key in this e example is 8 bits. Which is 2 to the power of 2 times by the length of the block. That is 4 times by 2 bits. Our block is 2 bits. 
And the number of possible values is 4, that is 2 to the power of 2, so we have 8 bit is the length of the key. In our general cipher then, if we have n bits, we have 2 to the power of n factorial possible keys, and each key is n times 2 to the power of n bits in length. if we just generalize that. Let's say we have a block of 64 bits. If n was 64, 2 to the power of 64, anyone know? Very large number times by 64. If n is a reasonable size, say 64 or 128 bits, then it turns out the key will be too large if we use this approach. Remember, a key is something that we need to distribute to someone else. We said with a one-time pad, it's perfect security, but the key is too large to use. We'd prefer a small key. If we use this approach of allowing all possible mappings, all possible reversible mappings, it's okay, except it turns out that the key as n becomes larger, the key becomes too long. A key of 2 to the 64 times by 64 is too large. 2 to the 64, 2 to the 32 is 4 billion. 4 billion, it's times 4 billion, it's trillions of bits. Trillions of bits is what? Terabytes. A key that we need to distribute if we use this approach is terabytes in size. And that's of no practical use because we need to distribute a key which is like a password. Maybe order of tens of bits to be practical to use. So, if we use this w approach of mapping plain text to any possible ciphertext, our key becomes too large if n is, say, 64 bits even. Even 32 bits would be too large if n becomes a reasonable size. If we make n too small, it means that we can do analysis quite easily. If n is just 2, our key is only 8 bits. But we can easily break a cipher when n is 2. We can do a brute force attack. We can even do frequency analysis or language analysis on, on the structure to break it. So we need to use a block or a value of n which is large. But using this approach, if n is large, then our key is too large. So it turns out that people have come up with alternative approaches to try to make it more practical, a block cipher. And that is what we're trying to get to called the Feistel structure for block ciphers. Feistel is a person who come up with this structure that simplifies the encryption instead of using all possible mappings, limits the mappings, but applies our concept of repeating operations. Don't just encrypt once apply multiple operations, substitutions and transpositions in iterations so that we get more secure but more practical to use. We've gone through a fair bit today. We'll have a quiz tomorrow on everything up until classical ciphers, not on this. And tomorrow after the quiz we'll talk and make you confused. We'll talk about confusion. <laughs> Quiz includes classical ciphers. Up until classical ciphers, including classical ciphers. Does not include DES and block ciphers. No block, no, none of this topic, no. Up until including classical ciphers.